Welcome back guys. So in this video we're going to be talking about one of the center features of almost every wood shop and that is the table saw and mobile workbench. And in this situation we have combined the two. So as usual I'm burning those midnight hours. We're about 2 a.m. when we completed this project and I just wanted to make sure that we could get the video out. So on this workbench having used it for a while with this video being delayed I can honestly say that you don't want to build it out of MDF like I did. You want to build it out of three quarter inch plywood, birch, redwood, either one would be fine. Uh, as it'll hold up longer. We started having some sagging and cracking on the center board on the lower portion. You could do an MDF top though, so that would be fine. I like using MDF because it's such a soft wood that's easy to, to route through, so we could add upgrades down the road like T-Track, uh, vice clamps, uh, and the reason that we use a double three-quarter inch top is so that if we screw into it, get paint and glue on it, over time you're going to mess up that top. So having two sheets on there makes it easy for you to just pull off the top sheet and replace it over time. I definitely recommend making this one of your earliest and first projects for your wood shop as it'll make your work flow a lot easier. Now with this DeWalt job site saw that we have installed on this table, we did run into an issue where the top of it is not perfectly flush. It bows up a little bit towards the center where the blade is housed. So we took some shims and we tried to shim it out with washers uh, just to try to make it as level as we possibly could while even just a hair under the table itself. So whenever you go to add T-Track later on, you would want to make sure you take all of that into account. But you want to try to get the table as level as possible across the entire workbench. Other items of note that you need to keep in mind when installing your specific job site saw is going to be the location of your dust port. In this circumstance, it's on the back. And we try to leave it a little bit of room so that you can get a hose in there, but you could always drill out the back with a hole saw and make it work. We also wanted to include power in a future upgrade, but without further ado, let's jump into the build, right? So here's the miter saw stand. I already have the 4x4 sitting there, so you always want to try to cut your longest pieces first uh, and save your shortest pieces for the end. That way you're making the most use. Now for this specific build, we got this off of remodelholic.com. Uh, he's got a very detailed plan that you can get off of his website. He's got videos that you can work along with that might be a little bit more detailed than mine. I was just showing my take on it and how we built this system. Uh, and looking at this video too, you know, we had the miter saw station build that we did last week. The foot was not level as we thought on the concrete, so we had to put some shims under that just to bring everything up to a level uh, point. All right, so let's talk about materials real quick while we're doing the cuts and getting the cut list up. First up, we've got the MDF that cost me roughly thirty-five seventy-eight per sheet. We needed three sheets, so that's three-quarter inch by forty-eight. We've also got six sixty-five for two by four by eight feet. We need three of those. We've got to get two four by four by eight foots at twelve thirty-two a piece, and then four-inch polyurethane swivel casters. Those are ten ninety-eight a piece. And we've got miscellaneous consumables: wood screws, leg screws, wood screws, uh, lock washers, flat washers. And also the DeWalt 8.5 inch portable table saw, which is 400 bucks. All together, that's going to be a grand total of $318.80 to complete this project. Depending on your area and based off of filming this video, which I did in February of 2021, while wood prices were still relatively high based off of previous assessments, um, not really, a lot of people are at home doing DIY projects and basically the supply is up. Or I'm sorry, <laughs> I had that backwards. The supply is down, the demand is up. So wood prices are kind of outrageous at the moment. You know, once this whole uh, COVID thing's over, maybe we'll be better off. So as we jump into the build, you can see that the miter saw station that we built first is coming into handy. Uh, we can make all these repetitive cuts for the legs and the stick framing that we're doing with the two by fours. Uh, it doesn't take long at all, and that's why we recommend building at your miter saw station and this mobile workbench with a table saw first, or at least setting up a table saw if you don't plan to put it within your mobile workbench depending on the size, right? Like if you have an actual industrial or cabinet size saw, then I would definitely, you know, not try to install that into a mobile workbench and instead have a separate uh, mobile workbench that you can float around your shop as needed. So the tools we used in this is gonna be a tape measure, miter saw, skill saw, straight edge. So your straight edge can be anything from the Craig system or in my case, I had very cheap, uh, just whatever the big box store brand was at the time. Uh, straight edge that you just have to clamp down to either side of the MDF and make your cuts. Uh, using standard Milwaukee tape measures, nothing fancy there. And just tons of pencils laying around so we can make sure we mark everything as we lose it. Cutting these larger sheet goods can be difficult. Uh, we've got these pop-up DeWalt mobile workbenches. Uh, a link in my 
description of this video if you guys want to get some. Recommend it. They've been great for assembly tables, uh, taking out to job sites, taking out to the family, doing renovations and remodels. So they have made, more than made up for their use. The last I checked, they're about 100 bucks. But as you can see here, we're strapping down that straight edge that I was talking about. So we just take our tape measure, measure it off the cut where we can, and then we're using standard C-clamps just to attach it to the table. So it's not an actual track saw, but you can make it work. You just have to accommodate for your skill saw and where the blade is going to land based on your skill saw's plate. Another popular method for making this cut, if you don't have a workbench or anything to go off of to set it on, you can always buy some of that pink insulation. Buy it as thick as you can, at least one inch, so your saw blade doesn't go through and hit the concrete. And then you can lay that in your garage floor, lay it on your driveway, and make your cuts on that so your blade's cutting into that insulation and not hitting anything that it shouldn't be. Uh, it's very popular. A lot of woodworkers still use it even to this day, even with their entire shop built up. So keep that in mind. Anything you can do to kind of make your life easier where you're not having to tilt these massive sheets around or work awkwardly and do anything dangerous. So being this early in our woodworking career and profession, we don't have dust collection yet, so we definitely try to keep our workspace as clean as possible. I like to take my blower and just get as much dust out of the shop as possible so we're not you know, constantly knocking it up in the air as we're moving around working. I'd also like to state that we did use pocket hole joinery for this project, so I know a lot of people aren't fans of it, but I like to be able to take anything I build for the shop back apart so that I can reuse the material, make changes down the road as I find better ways to improve things. The next best thing you can do while putting anything together is have a nice assembly process. Keep everything in order. So what we're doing is we're assembling the legs at this point in the framing so that we're going to be able to lay it all out on the floor and make sure we haven't missed anything, make sure everything's lining up and our cuts are accurate enough that we're not going to run into any problems because you don't want to get in the middle of the assembly and realize that you've missed a piece or you have to run to the store and grab something. Now that we have our legs and our rough frame put together, we're going to lay it out on the floor and lay the bottom piece on top of the legs. Right, we're doing this so that we can flip it over once we get everything nice and square. And using a nice piece of plywood or MDF means that it should be square coming. I would check just to verify. I've gotten some pretty rough cut. Uh, I don't use the term rough cut, but I've gotten some pretty not perfectly square pieces lately. So just definitely check that and make sure. And here we're doing something I would recommend everybody to do is pre-drill your holes, especially when you're using lag bolts. And we're using lag bolts to make sure we have enough strength on these wheels so that when we go to flip it or put material on it or roll it up on the back of a trailer, those lag bolts will be enough to tie into the 4x4 and keep from breaking or knocking anything loose. Definitely recommend putting swivel casters all across your workbench and have brakes on them. Uh, nothing's worse than when you're trying to put something together on top of the workbench using it as an assembly table and it's constantly wanting to roll everywhere on you. So every single wheel that I put on this had a brake and every single wheel could swivel and 360 degrees and it made it very easy to move it around the, uh, the shop and spin it and again just more pocket hole joinery to attach everything nothing got glued uh, just pocket holes and screws
So for this section, I recommend having two people. I didn't have anybody to help me, so I just went ahead and did it on my own. So I just verified that all my wheels were locked, and I went ahead and just grabbed it like the big boy I am and flipped it over. And the reason I recommend having a second person for this is I was very concerned that that sheet was going to bend in the middle and break because we didn't have any real support function on it. But surprisingly, even though it's just MDF, it did hold up really well and nothing broke, nothing cracked. But as you can see, you really don't want to be that rough on something that's brand new. And I was really concerned that with the casters and the lag bolts and the screws that it was going to try to snap off at the wheels. But we were able to take enough pressure off by picking it up on our shoulder and laying it over that nothing cracked and nothing broke. So definitely would have sucked to have to take everything back apart and rebuild it just because we messed up one piece trying to manhandle something on our own. So try to have a friend or a uh, family member there to just help take the pressure off the wheels. We then went through and marked all of our center lines and we're just using clips to help hold everything up. We want to make sure that we got some 2x4 bracing in there to make sure that regardless of what we put on top of the table, if we want to walk on it because I'm really bad about walking on top of all my equipment instead of grabbing a ladder, you know, you don't want it to break in the center. The center is going to be a weak point. So I try to keep everything at like a, a two foot spacing. But in this case, you know, we're working with a sheet of MDF that's four feet across. So we're just trying to center everything as much as possible directly. And it'll help, you know, in the long run for that stuff to, to last longer. If you want to get it perfectly center, one thing I did not account for when I was building this is I did not account for the three quarter inch MDF or plywood itself. So keep that in mind whenever you go to mount those two by fours that you will be a little bit offset if you don't account for that extra measurement. And again, you know, I find myself working alone all the time. So using some F clamps and C clamps and just standard uh, spring clamps is really going to help you be able to continue to function, even if you don't have a second pair of hands to just hold things in place. So I'm using some clamps to keep the pressure together so it stays nice and even with the other boards. And then I'm using other clamps to make sure that as I screw it in, it can't shift on its own side to side. It was at this point that we could really start to see the project coming together. This is where you start getting a little excited and you're like, I'm finally starting to get some of my woodworking uh, shop finished so that I can start knocking out some projects and maybe recoup some money that I've spent on all the material. Now this shop was a single car garage that was detached from my house and that's one reason why we were trying to you know, make as much use of the space as possible, but it definitely allowed for a three foot workbench to go all the way around on the exterior walls while we had this four by eight monstrosity of a mobile workbench in the center. So if you guys are worried about space, just keep in mind you can make the most of it or you can just cut the MDF sheets down smaller, still have this nice workbench without having to take up every single square inch of space that you've got available. The piece we're cutting now is gonna act as the center divider slash support between the beams on the middle. So we're cutting out notches. For this we're using an oscillating or multi-tool makes it quick and easy. If you don't have that, you could use a circular saw, a hand saw, even chisels. It's not hard to cut out these little notches just to make room for the two by four to fit in there. To mark the two by four spacing, I just took a tape measure and then I took a two by four after taking my line marking and traced around that two by four and then cut it out. So the center board, like I said, would be a little bit stronger if we used plywood instead of MDF and it would offer more support than the MDF did, but we were trying to rely mostly on the 2x4s to do their job and keep everything held together. But we needed to notch it and then slide it into place, so it gets a little bit tight, but definitely doable and while keeping all nice tight cuts. So now you'll see me take a speed square. I'll hold it at the base of the board that we just put in because I don't have anything else there for it to touch on to make it nice and square. With that speed square, we just want to make sure that we're getting this as straight as possible. You could also take a level and hold a level up on the side of it and see if it's level top to bottom. Either method will work. Just be mindful of once you tighten in that first screw that you need to check both sides and in the middle just to make sure you don't have anything out of alignment. You'll see me run a sander up and down the edge just because we're a little bit off there so it was sticking out just a hair. Wanted to make sure everything's nice and flush. And now we're ready to start applying the top now that we have the support in the center and everywhere else. When putting this top on, you just want to take a tape measure around the edges and then take some clamps once you've got everything perfectly aligned. You know, you get the proper spacing on every side. I like to have a slight overhang. Some people like to have their tables perfectly flush with the edge of the, the framing of the cart. Consider uh, Just keep it up to you, whatever your preference is. I would also say once you start putting screws into the top, you know, as soon as you put that first screw in the corner, 
double check your work and then check the other corners as you go. So I would start in one corner and then go to the opposite corner instead of trying to go a roundabout method, clockwise, counterclockwise, jump across to the other angle. That way you know you're gonna hold the proper square value on all sides. And keep in mind, this is the first three quarter inch sheet that we're putting down, so you can put screws on the top down. But whenever you're applying the sheet that go goes on top of this one, you're going to put your screws from the bottom up. That way, you don't see any screw heads. And you want to use screws that are short enough to where you still have enough material to put in T track, or if you run your saw into the table, you're not going to be hitting metal. There's also a few different methods that you can use to try to keep your screw heads as straight as possible because a lot of us like to have that very nice pristine look. I like to just use a straight edge so I don't need to do a lot of sanding. Some people use a chalk line. So whatever you guys want to use, whether you have a track saw or something else, you can just lay down across the top. That will follow that straight path. Now we don't have to put down a pencil line or anything else and saves a little bit of time, in my opinion, while still keeping nice, accurate lines. Now as we get ready to throw on that top layer, we will go ahead and we blow everything off, get all the sand off of it, get all the sawdust off of it, make sure we don't have anything that's going to get stuck in between, and then we're going to get each corner lined up, clamp down each corner, and start screwing it in so we don't mess it up. We want it perfectly aligned. Something you could do if it wasn't perfectly aligned, or if the sheet was a little bit larger than the workbench, instead of trying to cut two perfectly square sheets, you could just make sure that the bottom piece is right, and then use a router with a trim bit. And that would let you just run that ball bearing along the edge of it so you don't have to do as much cutting. And like any final surface, you want to tape it up before you cut it just to make sure you don't get anything that splinters out. This is especially important on plywood. And you can always take a router bit, do a round over edge or something else if you want to keep it even more smooth. But I like the square edge. And we take our Japanese saw to finish it off.